Good afternoon and happy Tuesday, uh, the first Tuesday of our March break, which is absolutely wonderful for those of us that are taking a bit of a break. Um, but for those of us who love to continue this conversation, we're here again. Um, Grandmother's Voice here with Wendy Roberts and Kevin Hamilton. And, uh, and I'm, I'm hosting today. Uh, my partner, Jody, is on vacation, a well-deserved um, vacation. And, uh, and so we're happy to be here and continue the conversation because even though we go on vacation, the conversation still needs, needs to happen, needs to continue. So welcome, Wendy. Welcome, Kevin. Um, I know that we're going to have, we have a bit of, um, a bit more time with you today. And, and we're so grateful and, and thankful that uh, you're able to join us because all of us are really on this learning journey of growing food, of the best time to grow or to start planting, um, you know, the best time to start, uh, you know, just getting our hands dirty in the garden. And uh, with you, Kevin, being on a farm, in an in a urban farm, there's an awful lot still that's happened in the background, even even in the cold winter months of all the things that that are there. So I saw last week that you held up that beautiful book from Lee Valley, the Gardener's Journal. Mm -hmm. And I, too, have one of those books that I've kept and uh, and and loved it, sitting up with a cup of tea and then just filling filling in my gardening journal. And then having all those different things that I'd done in the past to to also, yes, there we are, to also make sure that I'm that I'm moving things around, but keeping certain things uh, in the same spot because they like being in that same spot. So with all of us that are urban dwellers, um, we're so thrilled and honored that we have two people who are so invested in uh, not only sustainability, but also food security and food sovereignty and food safety, I think is what you had, uh, what, you, what you had called it the other day as well. So welcome, Wendy, welcome, Kevin, and I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, if, if folks are listening in too, and you have any questions, you can just put it in the side comments there for us. Um, I'll start, that was a good point of uh, talking about the Gardener's Journal there. This is such an amazing resource. I believe it was like $40. Like everything, it's probably 10 bucks more expensive this time around. But it's great. It's at Lee Valley. Um, it's called the Gardener's Journal. If I get that in. And then on the bottom, it says, um, I'll just read it. It says a 10-year chronicle of your garden. So in it, it has all kinds of amazing information. Um, kind of a schedule from month to month, January, February, March, April, what you should be doing, like digging in April, let's see what it says in March, prune your trees and shrubs, um, apply dormant oil sprays, examine your garden tools, fix, a lot of helpful stuff like that. And then the best part, like the next page has a garden layout and it's like a, a whole gridded system. And the beauty of this book is it has, so it's for 10 years, so the next page, is the next year and it has um, a spot for you to put year on um, what you're gardening. So then you can look at where you had everything in the last 10 years. Um, and then it has a, a guide for planting intensive beds and it has all your varieties, um, days to maturity, um, spacing, how long you should have them in your flats when you're starting seedlings, which is appropriate for today's talk. Um, that kind of stuff. It's got harvesting record, planting records. But the coolest thing that it has in here, in my opinion, is they have like a sheet for every day of the year. So January to December, 365 days. And then I'll just try and get that. It says the year there. It's got pictures of uh, there. It's sunny, cloudy, rainy, whatever. And your highs and lows for the day. And then it's got the spot for you to keep notes beside it. So on every page, there's 10 spots like that from top to bottom. And it's beautiful because you can look and see that on March 26th last year, we started parsley. Um, and then if you took good notes at the end, you know if you can see how warm it was that year. And then you can kind of extrapolate like, oh, it was uh, we got it in too early because there was a cold snap. And then you can kind of gauge and get a good idea from year to year. So highly recommend this book. 
Um, I mean, you could just start your own journal too, but there's a whole bunch of other extra great information in here too um, to keep us all on track. I just ordered mine yesterday. <laughs> oh, cool. Do you know how, do you remember the cost? I, I think it was 43. Okay, so it hasn't gone up. That's great. I think it was yeah. about that, yeah. Very valuable tool. Um, so I'll just, I'll go over a few things that I went over in previous weeks. Um, I'll start with the soil. Um, we are using here at McQuestin, um, this is the product. Let me know if you guys can see that. It says ProMix. Because we're only a third of the screen here. But yeah, it's ProMix. I got that. I think you can get that at uh, Lowe's and um, Home Depot and all that. It's, it's it says it's organic. It's listed by Omri. Omri, if you can see that. Um, where's that logo? Oops, sorry. Do you see Omri there? No. There, Omri. Oh. That is a, usually that, if it says Omri listed, it's not organic equivalents from the certifiers, but they are accepting a lot of Omri stuff. So for me, growing organically and wanting to get uh, keep chemicals and stuff out, I generally will use all that stuff. I have to go a little extra mile um, for certification and let my certifiers know, but mostly it's our home gardener, so I'll stop there. Um, so this soil has, um, it's got perlite and uh, vermiculite in it. It's got coconut husk. If you can find stuff with coconut husk, that has been a real lifesaver, a game changer, because that coconut husk retains a lot of the moisture. And so sometimes if I just give it a heavy watering um, on like Saturday or whatever, we don't have to come in Sunday to water. Um, I'm off site here. So it really retains the moisture. And I highly recommend finding a good uh, peat based or coconut husk based soil medium for starting your plants. Now there's a few different types of Mediums, there's another one that ProMix has that's just mycorrhizal fungi and mostly peat. Um, that product, there's there's potting mix and then there's seeding mix. So seeding mix is it is kind of null and void of any nutrition, uh, like for, for fertility. So, but it really helps with the germination. So when things germinate, we'll start it in seeding mix. And just when it's like this big, some people call it pin pricking. And then you kind of pull all the little guys out and put them in their own individual pots. So you'd only ever want them to get about this big. And then you put them into a potting mix. Now, I generally, because I'm lazy and I don't want to do all that extra or, well, it's not lazy. It's just um, time consuming when you have 30,000 seedlings on the go. Um, I just start everything in potting mix and generally I'm still getting my 80% germination. Um, getting back to, I'll rehash a couple other things too. Most of the time on your seed packets, when you buy seed, they should have the, the year that they tested it and there should be a germination rate. Um, the companies that I use, I don't know if I can put into the comments. Um, I don't have a thing to put comments in, but uh, William Dam is a good seed house. They're open from three to five. They're in Flamborough, uh, just outside of Hamilton here, or still in the city limits. They, they're they only open from three to five, and they have lots of seeds still. Uh, they're a great company. They're local. Uh, Johnny's is a company in the U.S. I deal with, and he it's worker-owned, which is great because they take pride in everything, and they got a real great plant breeding Um uh, great plant breeders that they work with and do in-house and uh, high mowing is the largest organic farm based seed company. And they're in the U S too. Those are my big three West coast seed is in Vancouver. They're pretty good. Um, and OSC is also in-house Vessies is also just up the road from us and Richter's for all your, um, herbs and stuff like that. They sell a lot of uh, live plants too. So Richter's is great. Um, I'm just reading here. Okay. Um, 
so yeah, that's uh, oh yeah, the Terry Lynn Brandt. Uh, someone wrote her name in there. She's a Mohawk seed keeper who I've heard great things about and can't wait to meet. Um, uh, Matchbox Garden is another local seed uh, house too. Um, so those are the great seed and there'll be germination rates and generally the information for how deep to seed it and all that is on use your seed packets as a good guide and most of the seed companies in their catalogs will have that information too. I really like Johnny's because they'll give you uh, a chart so it's really easy to look at and then it's all there and they're more for farm-based growers so they will give you like how many seeds you need per acre if anybody out there but again you're probably home gardeners so um can i can i ask you one question there kevin because you're naming off an awful lot of the um seed companies that you work with yep. and i'm wondering if you'd be able to i send us a list of that so that we can also populate it in the chat but sure. also I, I don't know if um, because I was absent for the last the beginning one um, and I kind of just sat in the background and the, and the second one. But I'm wondering, too, about um, some people may be going and buying their seeds at Canadian Tire or Lowe's um, and they have a they have an expiry date on an awful lot of those seeds. And so um, when you're mentioning to go to William Dam or Early Early Bird and Johnny's and Hopewell Seeds in New Brunswick and out, out there, there different places in BC, those seeds would not have a germination. They Those seeds would not have an expiry date. Am I correct? Yeah, it doesn't, if it does have an expiry date, yeah, it's kind of telling you that if you kept it at room temperature, I mean, I, we'll use our seed and then stick it in the freezer. So, I mean, if you put it in the freezer at negative 18 or whatever, then it'll stay good for uh, ever, 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 um, hopefully. So yeah, I used to be skeptical about putting like hot crop stuff, like hot peppers and that, but it, yeah, if, if it's, it just stays in homeostasis. Um, I don't have enough experience with taking it in and out of the freezer several years in a row because we generally use it up, but I don't think it really compromises it too much. Uh, the bigger the seed, generally speaking, the bigger the seed, the longer the viability. The exception is peas. Peas are like by refresh your pea seed for your snap peas or your shelling peas every year. And um, what's the other one? Onions. I've uh, made that mistake like three, four years in a row. Like, why are these onions so terribly germinating? And didn't realize that they're one of those ones you have to get to kind of fresh every year. So yeah, you can avoid that by putting stuff, take it out, whatever seeds you're gonna use, put it right back in the freezer. I'll send you some kind of Facebook Great questions. Um, I don't know. I'm not on Facebook right now. Sorry, we we're trying to live stream on Facebook too. Um, oh no, just with the high seeds, they have a chart. Ah, uh, okay. Amy's saying that's uh, high mowing seeds. I will send out an email, um, and they have a chart on that viability and how long the, the seeds will will last. Generally speaking, oil seed radishes are usually good too. Um, I did have a. Uh, a demonstration last week where I checked the vi viability, my germination rates, and I just took a plate with a brown paper towel or white paper towel, whatever, put the seeds on top of the paper towel, put another paper towel on top, watered it and left it in a warm spot. And then in three, four days, I'd put 10 seeds or 25, and then you can extrapolate that data. So if eight out of 10 went, then you're thinking 80%. Generally, it's good to do 25 or more if you can. But that's another way to see. And then you can just take those seeds when they sprout their little white tail comes out. Then you can just put them in your soil medium and water. Um, the other thing that I do with my uh, potting mix is I will sometimes I'll work some compost in. Um, I generally do three to one like three parts of my soil mix to one part compost. If it's something like chicken, cause that's a pretty, or sorry, cow, cause that's a not super potent. Um, then when you get into stuff like chicken, it's more like, or turkey compost, it's seven to one, seven potting mix to one compost. Um, and that will generally give you enough 
nutrition for your four weeks in your cells. Four to six weeks is uh, kind of what I will keep things in. The other thing I add, um, I don't want to promote cannabis, but a lot of the cannabis specific grow stores that are catering to that uh, market. This is called, it says Mike, uh, it's Mycorrhiza. That's the important thing to look at there. These products are granular and powder. It's also OMRI certified there too. Um, and 80% of the plants in the world have a symbiotic relationship with fungus. We know that the only way we get nutrition from the soil in readily available for plants is through fungal activity in the soil. So there's mycorrhizal fungi, there's ectorrhizal and endorrhizal, which meaning it grows on the root or it grows in and beside close to in close proximity. So your plant roots, they put out exudates that feed the fungus and the fungus will start to form. So by putting this inoculant in, um, there's ones that are for flower, so you can put it in when, uh, mix it in your soil when things are going to flower later in the season. And then there's ones to just start them. I generally try to start it because it will give you double and even triple the root mass. Um, so if you put that in your soil mix from the get-go, then you're going to get these really big, healthy root systems. And you can also put it in when you're transplanting. And uh, by doing that, they say through the soil food web that there's 100,000 years of fertility in the soil if you can get the biology working. So we're just microbially and biologically bankrupt in our soils, and that's from over tilling. So I only ever try to till down this much. I'm getting ahead of myself because we're talking about seedlings. <laughs> but that's an important thing. Um, and I have seen, they're saying it's a 30% increase in yields and health in your plant when you're inoculating um, and making sure that you have that uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so. Somebody did ask in the in one of the questions, what about horse compost or compost, sorry. Can you use? Yeah, so generally I should say too, the M word, when my certifier is around, the M word as in manure is a bad word. Um, it has to be compost. So when you're putting in compost and that's a, very excellent point. Thank you for whoever asked that. Um, it should be aged. I like to, it's only actually compost if it's been, been brought up to 65 degrees Celsius. So when they're making compost, they make their piles, they put their horse poop, all their material in, take a big long thermometer and stick it in so it gets right to the middle of the pile. And that has to be 65 degrees Celsius for three days. And then they flip it and work it. And then they wait till that middle temperature gets up to 65 again for three days. And then they do it a third time and make sure it gets up to 65. That way it kills all the pathogens and all the bad stuff that would be in the manures and the poops and all that kind of stuff. And it also kills all the weed seed, which is very important because a lot of compost that is subpar that has not been put through that, you're just spreading a ton of weed seed. Like I've put out stuff and all of a sudden I have pigweed and lamb's quarters, which I never had a lot of before or just different weeds. And I immediately know that that's from the compost. So that is important and you can get sick. And like all, a lot of the salmonella and a lot of the uh, E. coli and that kind of stuff, when we have recalls in the stores is from poor nutrient management where they put fresh manure on fields, especially with greens, that's generally what's happening. Uh, and then they're watering Overhead watering is also a bad thing for your greens. Try to water beside or under the plant. Drip line's good for that. But that generally that's from bad composting practices. So that is great to know. Um, so yeah, if the, if the horse poop has been sitting there for two years, I would say one to two to three years even, then um, that's fine. Um, yeah, horse isn't, uh, doesn't pack a super punch. Um, either like the chicken is much higher in nitrogen and the turkey um, and that kind of stuff. Uh, worm compost is absolutely the best, I should say, if you have access to vermicompost or worm compost, worm castings, they call it. That is gold. Uh, it's 50% humus and humus is what keeps that uh, humic acids and fulvic acids. The humus is what keeps the water retention in your soil and it uh, creates the conditions for all the good things to grow in the soil. Um, soil talk is like a lifelong talk. <laughs> um, so I'll just show you over here. I did start some, I did open flats here. Um, so these are our, 
um, leeks, uh, which we're starting now. I'm starting some woody perennials now, like uh, we're going to start some rosemary and some thyme and oregano. Um, and so these are just open flats, open trays. Um, and I do the leeks in rows. So I have here, I've got one, two, three rows in. I put my stick in and I don't know if you can see right there. Can, can you see that on there? Mm -hmm. that, that little yep. white strand? Yep. So that is a leek seed that has come <laughs> above the soil. Um, there's a 100 per row here. And I just lightly cover them. I kind of lightly cover everything. But my point in saying this is that even when you get the correct depth, when you're watering, oftentimes you dislodge them. Like I find little things growing just on my table um, in the little bit of soil that they're in. So like I have this watering can here, which that spouts a little bit aggressive when you're watering at that early stage. So I either stick my finger over it so it drips more. Um, what I do, and it's just simple, I'm pretty... I'm a Luddite, so this is just a glass bottle. I like using glass whenever I can. Um, and I just poked several dozen holes in the top. And then it's a much gentler rain. I mean, you can get, there's ones that, uh, um, watering cans that have the spout like this. And then there's another thing that has a, a whole bunch of holes on it that attaches and it's pointing up. So it forces the water to go up and then down instead of down right on the plants. Um, point being, you want to gently water your stuff in that germination stage so that they don't float out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my watering talk. And then one more thing. This is a, a grow right filter. You can get these for about $40. Again, uh, not promoting the cannabis, but uh, the stores, they, they have so many good products there that are, uh, I think, more important for growing your vegetable gardens than anything else. Um, but like this mycorrhizal fungi stuff was never available when you just walk into stores. I'd have to specially order it, but now it's all here. And this is another product called Bokashi Plus. It's another um, inoculant. And this can turn table scraps into compost in two weeks. So if you were to dig a little trench just under the ground, like, I don't know, 10 inches, 12 inches, and put all your table scraps in there, and then you put this kind of powderized uh, bokashi over top and then bury it, in two weeks you could dig that up and it will be all turned. It's a really aggressive way. It's the Japanese composting system in Japan. They, uh, When you're doing your curbside pickup for compost, you just put a powdering or dusting over top of all your kitchen scraps and that breaks it down real quick. Anyways, that's a, just another good one to use. You can put some into your potting mix as well and it just helps uh, activate microbes and get those symbiotic relationships happening uh, between all the, the beautiful things, the microarthropods and protozoa and amoebas and nematodes and fungi and all the beneficial bacteria. There's uh, about 6 billion organisms in every handful of good soil. Um, there's so much happening and we're sending people to Mars and wasting billions of dollars and not looking at our soil. Another story. <laughs> um, here is a bunch of trays. So this one here is, um, geez, I think it's about a 500. Uh, so there's 500 or some odd cells in there. I, when I have limited space, I'll use these to get things germinated and up. They're a little tricky to use because the holes are so small, but when you're in limited space and you have limited light and the other thing is, um, most things do best germinating in about 80 degrees Fahrenheit or like 22 Celsius. So if I'm just wanting to conserve my space, my potting mix, my heating bill, all that kind of stuff, I will use these smaller ones. This one here is a, oh, is a 288. 
and it's also see it's got the holes in there so it got, has good drainage they're really small too but um you could just do rows of uh of things because there's 12 across and i could do like uh, say pepper tomato eggplant and then you know you've got your rows and then you can pot them up to bigger ones i think this is a 128 this is a 72 um this one is a 50. I, I really like these ones. They're not uh, good on conserving soil because you see how long the plugs are. Um, but it provides a giant space for your roots to grow. I will start my seedlings and I, I only ever want them really four to six weeks. So if I'm going to put, uh, if I'm going to take out, say, a bed of salad mix or a bunch of lettuce, I know it's coming out. Four weeks before that, I'm going to start my next, uh, whether I'm going to put broccoli in, say, afterwards, I'll start them in my plugs. If you know that you're going to be challenged with timelines and stuff like that, um, it's good to have the deeper cells because you'll get a bigger root system. It's a little trickier to pull your plugs out, but I think for gardeners, you can take a little time where, you know, if I'm trying to get 6,000 of something in, I don't want plugs breaking and stuff. So that's the, the difference for those. But um yeah you'd, you'd plant four weeks before so they're not in super long i really like 50s um if i if i could only use one plug i would use 50s because it's like the perfect um amount of soil in there and it's the perfect amount of um medium and growth yeah the the 72s will sometimes get uh they call it root bound so what happens is the, the roots in the bottom will just start twirling in a circle and you'll notice the plants suffering. And you'll look, when you look at the bottom of the roots, you'll see them going brown and not good. I mean, you can always, you can still save the plants and just put them in the, in the ground. Um, or you add a bit more fertility, but generally in the fifties or larger, you're not going to get that in your four weeks, but uh, you will in the 72s sometimes, depending if it's a vigorous plant, like a tomato, they go really fast depending on what it is. So like celery and stuff like that, or uh, say parsley or green herbs. Um, yeah, so 50s are good. And then the other ones. So you can start things in those open flats like I did with the leeks. And then you, you could do everything just in the open flats if you didn't want to go out and buy more plastic or whatever. Um, and then you just scoop kind of underneath and get the soil and then really gently i just go like this back and forth with my hands and get the soil off the roots a little bit um and then i'll put them into bigger pots if whatever you have lying around we do a lot of work with uh like those biodegradable coffee cups and i don't have one here but yeah just like you know like a tim hortons cup but without the tim hortons uh you can poke a few holes in the bottom so you get some drainage. Um, but yeah, those work just fine. Like, I mean, I'm just trying to use refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle kind of thing. Like um, reduce is the first R and the most important. So if you can find things around um, egg cartons, people use, um, there's lots of different things that you can grow in. And again, like the deeper you have, the more root space for peppers and stuff. If anybody is a, uh, I won't say foolish, but it's a little early to start peppers and tomatoes, in my opinion. Um, I like them growing, uh, always growing. And then as they grow, I'll put them in a bigger pot and a bigger pot until they're ready to go in the earth. I don't ever want them to stagnate. Um, so I just, I really just try to plant them like mid to even late April, my tomatoes. So they're in a constant growth. I don't want a huge tomato plant going in the ground. It's kind of like, there's, there's too much of a shock to it. Um, and then when things are shocked, that's when disease and bugs and there's more opportunity for the bad things to get in and attack your plants. Um, if you're doing peppers, these are great pots too, a six inch pot. Um, Cause then you'll just really get a nice big pepper plant going in. Uh, I wouldn't go any bigger than that. And generally I don't like the tomatoes and the peppers and the eggplants and those kinds of larger things. I don't like them getting any more than eight inches tall. That's a bit too much. But having said that, people do all kinds of things and uh, it works just fine. Is there any more questions on our, nope.
Okay. Um, these ones are really great too. They're 24s. They're nice big cells. I, I like to do peppers and uh, tomatoes and some of those things in these bigger cells. Um, yeah, they really work well. Um, one other thing too, uh, with the 48s and like a lot of these trays that are 72s in that, they're flimsy. So I will put them in a one second, a hard plastic bottom. So they're not flimsy. This one is obviously super aerated. So the roots, if they go through, they just air prune by themselves. And then there's these hard black trays. Um, so some of them do have these holes on the bottom to let water out. There's ones that don't have holes and that's totally fine. Um, because you can water in the tray and then the water stays there. So it makes the roots go down and into it. So as long as you're not over watering, cause you do not want things to go anaerobic, anaerobic meaning no flow, meaning lack of oxygen, uh, then you will get sickly plants. So you just want to be careful on how much you're watering and, and kind of gauge that. Um, and I don't think I said this grow right filter that you can find at a lot of these stores. It does how many thousands, 40,000 gallons or 150,000 liters of water. So it's very cost effective. But what it does is it takes all the junk out of your city water. So if you're on municipal water, you want to get the fluoride out. You want to get the, um, you know, all the bad stuff, the, especially the chlorine. I couldn't figure out when I was making compost teas why they weren't bubbling and doing what they did. And I was like, oh, my gosh, it's the first time that I've gardened in a city um, down here at McQuestion Farm. And I just, yeah, I felt silly about it because i'm supposed to be the pro <laughs> i mean you still get uh the nutrient and stuff but you're not feeding life into the soil and organic farming to me is you're not feeding your plants you're feeding the soil so that's uh an important difference um a couple of other things and then i'll get back to the actual seeding stuff um so when we're labeling things um, and it doesn't really matter how big or small you are with us. It's just, there's labels, things that get mislabeled. We have, uh, we call it tomato mysterious or, um, eggplant mysterious. We put the French on there, but because we don't know what it is. And then we'll just say, ask people, Hey, who wants a mysterious tomato? We don't know what it's going to be. Um, the reason that happens, uh, one sticks fall out or where somebody forgets to label it. Or most of the time, if I'm just using a pen or just using a Sharpie or a pencil or whatever, over four to six weeks of watering and it being in the sun, that will wear off. I don't care how good the Sharpie is. Uh, the only thing this on, we're just using these spent, um, plastic knives, whatever people cut up. I cut up the, uh, uh, my plastic yogurt containers, cut them into strips. Those are great. The Sharpie will stay on that. That's a good way to do it. Make sure it's good. I mean, it will still come off if you try and work it, but it's, it will last the four to six weeks. The other thing, uh, we have, I, I will use a pen sometimes if you're stuck, but I just push, if I'm using a popsicle stick, I push super hard on it. So it makes an indentation and then I can shade over it with a pencil later and find out what it was. Um, but the best thing I have these grease pencils. So there's, there's the ones that, you know, that they, they wrap around like that and there's a little string and you pull it down. That's the grease pencil I'm talking about. You can get these at most of the places you get your seed um, and that, but this will stay on, whatever you're putting it on much better than anything else. Um, so we've gone to almost exclusively using these grease, grease pencils because we're using a lot of popsicle sticks to label our stuff. And we're doing like 30,000 plus seedlings and selling like 10,000 of them. So it's really important for us to get our orders right. Nobody wants a, uh, you know, a, a, a brown sweet pepper when they ordered bread. <laughs> it's a very big disappointment for many reasons. The flavor is not as good as on the brown ones, but um, one thing too, I'll go back, uh, when you are ordering your seeds, because we live in a Northern climate, 
If you're in and around the golden horseshoe here, uh, which I call the banana belt, we can generally grow everything uh, that says 110 or 120 days. But there is a lot of northern varieties uh, like the chocolate beauty, which is a, a sweet pepper that does mature in like 65, 70 days. Um, you might want to take that into consideration when you're looking at it. So it'll say days to maturity, um, which gen which means if you put soil, uh, if you put the seed directly in the soil in, the, in your garden, from that point when it germinates, you will have 100 days, 80 days, 75 days till it's mature and ready to eat. So those are good things to take into consideration when you're planting your garden. Um, yeah, so getting back to the, the watering, I try to get the chlorine in that out of it. If you don't have one of those little filter things, um, check with your municipalities. Some of it you can just put in a big container with open and the chlorine will off gas. Like I'm mostly worried about the chlorine because that's anti-life. You know, it, it doesn't allow for the microbes to grow and that kind of stuff. So uh, I try to, to avoid that. So in some municipalities, it will just off gas if you leave it out. And the sun, you know, we have these UV filters in our houses to kill pathogens and stuff. Um, so a glass bottle, if you have one of those big demijohns or carboys that people brew wine in, um, if you have some of those, you can just put those outside in a sunny spot and let them get some sun on it. Uh, and as long as you're using them in like two, three days, because algae and stuff will grow on them. But that's a good way to kill things in it too um, and let them off gas. Mm -hmm. Is there a question here? Yeah, did you see that comment there, Kevin? Yep. From Antoni? Um, does it go to Sorry. Sure, let me just read it here. Yeah, uh, yeah. As our garden is growing in size, it seems harder to get what is needed to maintain due to the rising cost of soils. Um, starting the past three years, no-till gardening. Nice work. It's two beds for some vegetables to save on water and soil use. um so what what is the question there just the that how do you keep the costs down probably that or just uh what he's been doing in order to keep the cost down i think it was just a general comment really yeah so i mean the best way to keep your cost down is to can contact your whatever local growers you have like we split on a tractor trailer of potting mix almost every year um, with a local farmer and you know when we can bulk up our orders like that and I mean just everything in life um, try to find the people and bulk order stuff like so know your neighbors and that and I mean as a grower too as a farmer I'm hoping people will get together and and approach me and say hey I'm eating 250 pounds of carrots a year that's two pound bag a week or whatever um, knowing those numbers so then I can have growers that will or eaters that want to get food delivered every two weeks in bulk. Um, yeah, the, the more you can order, like I'm growing, uh, ordering trays, I'm ordering tarps. That's the other way to keep your cost down. If you're doing no till, I imagine you probably have some tarping system or to, to keep the soil from being exposed and weeds from growing up. So you're ready to put stuff in. The other thing for the mulch is like uh, having hay or straw or wood chips. Wood chips is a little trickier, but all those things to keep your, the mulch will keep your cost down for your fertility because generally you're going to have after two, three years, especially you're going to have all that microbial life and stuff in your soil that should be recycling nutrients. Um, it's good to add compost tea. So this is a whole nother discussion and this gets into what I'm, I, I, I was um, <laughs> brain fart for lack of a better word um, in the watering. Um, there's something called damping off and please feel free to put more questions in the, in the comments and I'll answer them uh, as soon as I can. Um, one of the biggest 
problems still professional farmers face if you don't have an automatic watering system, which I do not, and at home is overwatering. So there's something called damping off. So you'll have your plant and here is the stalk of it. And all of a sudden, right at the right at the base where it's coming out of the soil, it gets all of a sudden really skinny and then the plant just falls over and that's damping off. It's a little fungal fungus bacteria that gets on the on the bottom of the stem right where it comes out of the soil and that's from overwatering and it will just fall over ways to avoid this and i've seen people lose hundreds and hundreds of seedling because i'm going out for the day eight hours and it's a greenhouse and it's hot and there's sun and they just water the heck out of things and then go off thinking that cool i'm not going to have to go back to water and they do that several times and by keeping that moisture at the top that's when that fungus grows and kills your plant. So to avoid that, um, two things you can do. One is let your plants dry out. Like is, if, if, this is a, if this is a leaf, that's my, got a short screen here. If that's my stalk and that's a leaf coming off, so it would be like this. Um, when I've underwatered, the leaves will start to go, and they'll start to get sad like that. And that's one indication to know that they need water. They'll just start to flop. Um, but yeah, just looking to see, and I pick up my trays. That's a really great way to pick up your trays. And if you can feel the weight of the water, then you know if there's still water moisture in the soil beneath. Um, if you're always watering to the top, you're going to have that damping off problem. So that's one way is to stress your plants out a little bit because when they go from your greenhouse or your seed um your your seed trays and get transplanted if they've had no exposure to the wind and all that kind of stuff or no extremes of being a little bit dry too wet that kind of thing then they're going to be weaker plants um having said that i'm getting a little bit ahead of myself too but before you transplant any of your seedlings you should um, harden them off, which means put them outside. So when the temperatures are going to be like five degrees and above, um, and you see a stretch of that, put them outside, let them get the sun and the wind and uh, the temperature fluctuations. Because in greenhouses, we generally have a, a, a good stable temperature. You want them to experience that before they go out so they're stronger. Um, the other way to deal with that damping off problem, which I was talking about, is to do uh, compost teas. And I didn't even think of this until a soil uh, agronomist biologist uh, mentioned it to me because I never even thought about damping off because I usually don't do not have the problem. And I think the reason um, is that we're doing compost tea. So in my when I make a compost tea, I'll take compost again that 65 degrees Celsius proper compost and things should be labeled as such. Um, and I will take compost, I'll put it in a bag that's permeated. So I use my old grain bags that are woven poly. Um, so essentially it's like a big tea bag that water can go in and out of. I take a 25 gallon or more um, aquarium pump and it's got the hoses on the end. Uh, so it's really simple. It's a little sophisticated, I guess, but not really. Um, essentially it's just like making tea. The difference is, is I'm making it aerobically. I don't like things going anaerobic because when things are anaerobic, that's when all the bad bacteria and stuff grow and it will outcompete all your, your good beneficial bacteria, your arthropods, protozoas, nematodes, all that kind of stuff. Um, and good fungi. So I take these two air hoses put it in the bottom of my bucket of my barrel whatever i stick the bag of compost i'll take um one scoop full of some soil from the forest and a scoop full of compost depending on how big your if you're doing a big barrel i'll take like a full shovel full of both and if you're doing it in small buckets then just uh use something like this, maybe um, a six inch pot. And so I put the air hoses in, stick it on the bottom, put the bag on top of it in that order. Because if you try to get the, if you fill up your barrel, then someone's going to be holding you by the, uh, 
ankles as you try to fish that under after the water's in there. So yeah, hoses, compost, water, and I let that bubble for 18 to 24 hours and then I spread it. Um, and you're welcome. That's a good stuff. We're doing this every week, so please tune in again and we'll do some uh, in-person workshops throughout the uh, summer um, for sure. Um, so yeah, so that 18 to 24 hours, I let that bubble. And then at that point when it's aerobic like that, meaning it's got the oxygen in the bubbles, then it's living. So the forest microorganisms that were in that soil should be inoculated into that water too. Anything more than that, they tend to die because they're in an ant most things can't live in water right and especially those soil microbes so then i will spread it um you can do foliar sprays and put it in like just a spray bottle i think this was from like dollar store or whatever and then you can just mist and do the foliar sprays underneath your seedlings so it gets underneath because there's uh, things called stomas on your plants and the stomas are they're on top but they're underneath in the armpit too so I, I spray like on an angle underneath and on top that's one way you can get fertility and that compost and all those good things um, and then it makes a biofilm on the edges of your leaves too that will help protect against disease pests that kind of thing but if you water in your soil too then you're feeding your soil microbes and that was a way that i guess i was avoiding unbeknownst to me or not even thinking of that damping off because there was good life and uh, again, those bad, that's an anaerobic thing too. When there's too much water there, there's not enough flow and oxygen. So that's what causes that damping off. Um, and yeah, and again, that uh, if you can get that chlorine out of your water is a big one. Um, another thing that you can use, this is, um, this is kelp based fertilizer. It says dramatic uh, organic there. And it's got all that same labeling that Omri and stuff. And so, I mean, here it says 241, which is nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. And this is uh, kelp based. So you can get their stuff called fish emulsion. And fish emulsion is. If you can get fish hydrosylate, that's the best. Uh, fish emulsion is they take the, they catch the fish, they harvest the fillets off it, they press the rest of the fish to get the omega oils and stuff out of it. There's more extraction. And then what's left over, that slurry is what they call fish emulsion. So it's, it's not alive. It's had a lot of the nutrient taken out. It still works good. It's a, it's a, readily available form for your plants because it's water soluble to uptake. So when you send a soil sample off, um, they are testing for nutrients and stuff that is water soluble. Um, if you sent a soil off to a lab, there's special labs that will look at actually what is in your soil, not what's available, but what's actually in. And that's when we get to that. There's a hundred thousand years of fertility stuck in the crystalline structure of your clays, sand, silts, that kind of stuff. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, um, water solubility. So, and all the chemical stuff, that's all water soluble. And, uh, you know, without getting into it too much, I don't need a $25 million study to tell me that the stuff with the hazardous warning labels, that's water soluble. Conventional agriculture is going to be healthier than organic compost broken down by mother nature. That's been feeding us for time immemorial. Um, yeah. Um, the other, the fish hydrosylate. Now that is just, they take the fillets off and then you get the, the rest of the fish. So that's like the slurry that they'll make. And that has all a lot more nutrient in it and is feeding your soil. So that's the best stuff. And if you get any of these products, um, Ascophyllum is a special type of kelp that I also get from, I'll have to put a list of places I get, order these things, but for 300 bucks, I mean, that can get you three years of that stuff. I do a lot. So I order this big four gallon thing and uh, that Ascophyllum is a dynamic accumulator. So it's kelp that's regenerative. It grows in the ocean. Dynamic accumulator, this is great information too, is a special kind of plant 
There's not a lot of them. Um, stinging nettle is another one. Um, comfrey is another one. And these are great plants to establish around your gardens too, on your per perimeters. Um, stinging nettle is the one that when you touch it, it makes your hand burn. That grows everywhere on the planet. And it is that and comfrey, which you could establish comfrey in and around your compost piles. So when it rains heavy and water is leaching off, the comfrey will grab all that leach and all that nutrient that's leaching out and fix it into its leaves. And you can cut that plant three times a year. And I beat it up a little bit. Uh, I bludgeon it with a couple of stones to break up the cell walls a bit. And I'll stick that in my compost tea as well. Um, and then that will give you whatever nutrients that plant. So a dynamic accumulator is a plant that will take all nutrients available to it. So like tomatoes and peppers and different things like tomatoes have a carrying capacity of like 56 uh, nutrients predominantly. And if they're available, it will take them up and it will make a healthy plant. Bugs, pests won't be able to bug it, um, pun intended, uh, if it has all those nutrients in it. So the kelp, the ascophyllum, has all 88 minerals that are available in, 88 minerals are in ocean water, so it has it. So it's a really, really, really good um, fertilizer to use, and it's water soluble. So, and when you buy any of these products, if you were to buy the, the fish emulsion or the fish hydrosylate or the fertilizer with the kelp, it will have the dilution rates on the back and the instructions of how to use it. So just follow those instructions. I tend to err on a, on a little less than they recommend because it is a product that they want you to buy. So generally I try to do a little bit less and observation, look at your plants. If your plants are looking nice and green and dark green, then that's a good indication that they're healthy um, and they've got nice stalks. That's also good. And I'm going to backtrack really quick. Um, I've covered a lot. The most important, two really important things. I talked about damping off. I talked about hardening your plants before you put them out. Um, sun scald is the other one. So if you don't have full spectrum lights, like up here we have, you can see those strip lighting. That's just your typical uh, long tube fluorescent lights. You can grow under those. You're not getting full spectrum unless you buy one that says full spectrum. So when I'm using those lights, which I do, um, I keep the lights like about this far off my plant when they're not the full spectrum ones. That way they get a nice, strong, thick stalk. If you have your lights way too high above, the plants are going to grow and reach and you'll get these little spindly bad seedlings that are just going to fall over at first wind. Um, so that's really important. You get your lights right on them. If you're using those fluorescents, generally the LEDs or the uh, halogen bulbs or other types of lighting, you'd have to do a little bit of research, but I generally do about 18 to 20 inches on the full spectrum LEDs in that. Um, so I have them raised above. So that's one thing. And if you're growing from just uh, the cheaper, more affordable fluorescent lights, even, even the uh, fluorescent bulbs that you put in your uh, lamps, you can still use all those, but you just have to get them really close to the, the plant so they don't stretch. Um, the other thing is that um, you'll get sun scalding. So when you're putting your plants out to harden them off, you have to do it for maybe four or five hours. Um, in the full sun and then put them in the shade or back in your greenhouse or back under your lights. And then the next day, extend that another hour, two hours until you start to get up to the eight and 10 hours. If you do it too much, you'll get sun scalding, which just looks like a white, it almost looks like somebody came and put some white chemical or something on the plant. And it just makes it, it's a sunburn for plants. They almost always bounce back. For me, it's really bad when I'm selling seedlings and they're all sun scalded to some extent. So I really try to avoid that. So we have better lights, but that's the thing you can do. Just take them in and out of the, um, the sun. Uh, yeah, those are really important. And I'm in the Yukon. However, there's an interesting company in Tofino, BC called NAAS. Um, and what do, what products do they sell, Emery? 
imagine it might be some fertility stuff or mm. Mm. maybe oh yeah oh here okay nice yeah anything that's probiotic and you know we want to get biology we want to get living things in the soil it's uh it's so important to have good drainage the other thing like that is really important tool that we use um is uh a broad fork which is a big wide it's like a big u-shape um it's like this it's u-shaped and it has about 18 inch or two foot spikes on the bottom of it and it's got two handles that i grab onto i jump on i don't have one in here and, and then turn it around work it back and forth back and forth side to side like this it's a real great workout <laughs> if you're doing a large space then it's wow you want to get some like football players or somebody yeah. to help you do it but um it gets down and then i just pop the soil back i don't mm -hmm. it because i don't want to again the more fungus is a hollow tube under a microscope and it chelates and extrudes and sucks nutrient off of the crystalline structure of sand silt clays that kind of stuff and recycles it the more you break up your soil you break up those tubes and those tubes will transport nutrient to where they need to go so in a fungal network under your soil if you have all these fungal strands that are intertwining and joining and connecting to each other they create a system that's intelligent and that it can actually move nutrients from the largest single celled organism is in Oregon state and it's like 2,200 hectares and it's moving nutrient all over the forest. So if there's a calcium, selenium, whatever deficiency somewhere, it will move it to where it needs to go. It's really amazing stuff. So um, yeah, that broad fork is great to break up the dead pan because if you're rototilling or plowing or disking, you're always going to only get down so far and you'll create a compaction level that the roots can't get past. And we know that roots will go down hundreds and hundreds of feet. We've proven this. Um, even like lettuce will go down four or five feet if it mm -hmm. has the space to go. So by putting those prongs in and popping it back, you've created the space. And then two, when they get down that deep, there's always a little bit of moisture there. So not only are you going to have the moisture, but you're going to have access to more nutrient too along that um, that root mass. So starting those fungal inoculants in when you're starting your seedlings is an amazing step in the right direction. It's the best foot you can be getting off on um, and using some of these kelps and stuff like that to really have a good, healthy seedling going in. Well, Kevin, there's been so much uh, learning that's happening here in just an hour. And no wonder that uh, this is a weekly a weekly live because there is just so much to learn. Um, and I've kept notes like a like a crazy, you know, not I just kept notes and, uh, you know, of, of where to get the seeds from, the temperature that the, the soil should stay at, talking about the compost uh, the, or the compost, sorry, the three to one or the seven to one with its chicken. Um, making sure that it's at a certain temperature when you are using manure and making sure that you're turning it over quite often. Um, I have also have the best thing is the worm compost, right? Uh, you know, make sure that right now it's too early for tomatoes and green peppers and uh, making sure that we're actually using some of the um, hydroponic stuff that is in some of the stores that uh, that is growing, you know, the other things, um, and and using the, those kinds of uh, those kinds of things. But most importantly, the, what I'm getting from you today is uh, is the the fertilizer, the the fungus, the making sure that we've got the right density and the right extraction or the right mixture in order to make our plants uh, really strong before they go into the garden. Um, any last words, Kevin, because we have a minute left. <laughs> yeah. Um, happy gardening. We at McQuest and we will be having a seedling sale too. And I'm employing a lot of this stuff I'm doing. Um, yep. That'll be coming up. Uh, I think at the end of March, we'll have our list of what seedlings we'll have. And, uh, I'm sure there's other people to, I don't know, Wendy, if you're doing a sale as well. Um, not as, not as yet. No, but we okay, might come I'll and, uh, visit you. <laughs> nice um yeah and uh feel free to i think you, if you contacted grandmother's voice they have my contacts and uh 
Desagon Densta, I would love to hook up with you if you are around because I'm doing some stuff uh, in and around Brant, Brant County as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be great to, to get connected. Mm -hmm. And we are uh, getting some learning uh, through Terry Brandt, through the Mohawk Seed Keepers in the summer. I think it starts in April until August. Um, and we were fortunate enough to have a, a full session with uh, people that we're working with. I think there was 14 seats. Um, I think most of them are already purchased. Uh, there may be three or four um, seats available if you're interested in learning from okay. Terry Lynn. And, uh, and learning more importantly about um, food security, food sovereignty and food safety, uh, because we learned today how important it is for food safety, that we don't get sick, that we make sure that the nutrients and the soil and the compost is, uh, is done. And what I, what I want to leave here, I think, is that we're not feeding the plants, we're feeding the soil. And so that was really key for, for my learning today. I just want to thank you, Kevin and Wendy. And, you know, it's been wonderful learning all these things and uh, and wonderful having this uh, collaborative partnership that we have with each other that we can learn with each other and and uh, grow safely, uh, grow securely and uh, and grow uh, our own food, because we know that in the future it's going to be in the very near future. It's going to be very difficult to have affordable food. So thank you again. Uh, and have a wonderful March break. And we'll see you next Tuesday at this time, 12 o'clock, uh, to continue the conversation. Meanwhile, right, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, bye-bye.